So there you are. So classical realism. That. What are the. What are the other. What are. So that's so on the basis. Of so so on the basis of that. Now that we've. Now you can see that these are uh, one-offs. It's not really Pierre Cudlin. It's somebody's. What do you call it? Uh, Knock off. Knock off, yeah. So the first one is idealism. And idealists only believe that the ideals are real. And the example I, I use for that is, 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 the, uh, is the standard that underlies a Judeo-Christian civilization, love thy neighbor as thyself. So all of these are knockoffs from classical realism. So the emphasis is on neighbor, and in order to, to meet the standard of classical realism, that has to be an abstract ideal. It's abstract because we don't see it or taste it or hear it. It's in our imagination. So here's your neighbor at this table, and if you got up, you could touch him, and you could see him, and you could hear him. He took a shower, so you can't smell him, but uh, you get the picture, right? But Neighbor in love thy neighbor as thyself includes him, but also includes every human being who has ever lived and will ever live. And that's why it's an abstract ideal, because you can't see or touch or smell everyone who would physically meet or experience materially every human being who ever lives. But that's what that means. You have to love the ideal of a neighbor, which includes him and her. Is that Littman's idea? Hmm? Littman has the idea. And oh, of course, he's, a, he's an Aristotelian. Was it, was it yeah. right, but was it uh, there some play to talk about that, or is that uh, an invention of Littman's? Of the uh, the neighbor being, and like, you know, the American being, not just the, the plurality of voters, but every American that was. Of course, is the, of course. He's an Aristotelian. He didn't invent it. He's tried to bring back classical realism. Right. And by the way, that book um, was a bestseller in the early 1950s. Now, you know that very few people understood exactly what he was saying, but there was something about what he was saying that caught the attention of Americans after World War II. Even though, the, even though Plato and Aristotle had been gone and, and, and no one paid attention to them for about 2,500 years. When I was uh, on the campaign, I, um, they put me up with some, some old couple in the middle of you know, nowhere, Virginia. It's outside of uh, Farmville, which I'm sure you're familiar with. I am familiar with it, by the way. I taught in Lynchburg, Virginia. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Which Lynchburg's is, not very far. That's my point. Yeah, wow. I, uh, yeah, this guy was in, in Farmville, and uh, I, I was right outside of town and stayed with them, and they. Uh, we were talking about politics now because you know I'm working on the campaign, and uh, I mentioned something about Littman, and he was he was surprised that, that anybody still knew or talked about or you know knew anything about Littman. He said he used to read the, the columns he wrote in the paper and he, every week, you know, or whatever he'd, he'd wait and read them. Well, how old was this guy? Sixty or something. Well, he must have been one of the he he, he wrote a, uh, a column for what, what was the New York Herald Tribune, a New York paper that went out of existence. And then he went from there to uh, Newsweek, which was owned by the Washington Post. The Grahams, that movie is coming out about the Post. You want know, to see it? It's about the Pentagon Papers. They published the Pentagon Papers. He got in trouble Costner. for it. So, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, he, he's trying to bring, he doesn't mention their name, but he's trying to bring back Arist uh, classical realism. So you have to love the abstract ideal, but not to the exclusion of your material self. Not to the exclusion of your material self. So the idealist, who only concentrates on the abstract ideal, looking at this. I mean, he looks, or she looks, and you say, what does it mean? The idealist says, following her theory of reality, love thy neighbor. Because for the idealist, by definition, 
only the ideal is real. No 60-40 anymore, it's 100%. And the example we gave was uh, the Underground Railroad. Uh, the slaves escaping from the South were looking for houses with some kind of sign, the light would be on, there'd be something on the porch, etc. And, and this family comes across what they think is a home on the, uh, as one of the stops on the Underground Railroad, but it's not. But it's still a decent family, and they, and they say, could you please help us? Because otherwise we're going to be caught by these slave catches, and we'll probably all be killed. As an example to other slaves who are trying to discourage them from escaping themselves. So the question is, what does the classical realists do? Well, if they're caught helping an escaped slave, they'll be killed too. Not only will the man who answered the door, but his wife and his children will suffer terribly at the hands of these uh, bigots. So, using this standard, they say something like this. You have to understand, we'd like to help you, but you have to understand my position, you know. We'll suffer terribly if it's discovered. So this is what we'll do. We'll feed you, and we're going to let you stay in the barn. You can get under the hay, it'll be warm underneath there. But you have to promise up before the sun comes up, you got to leave. We will do everything we can to help you, but we can't commit suicide in the process, because that's what we'd be doing. That's what love thy neighbor is. In other words, you emphasize the idea you have to help these people as best as you can, as you can. can help people, but that, that it has, can't come to the sacrifice of your own life and the life of your people and your family. But for the idealist, you, your existence and your well-being and the well-being of your children are, are, meaning, are literally meaningless because they're not real compared to these escaped slaves who are their neighbors because the neighbor is an abstraction that includes everybody. So by the next morning, the slave catchers find them in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a bedroom in their house. They kill the slaves and kill the family, and that's the result. Nobody benefits. Why? Because this is not real. This is not a real way of living. It appears to be, but it's not. So that's it. And, and often Plato especially is accused of being an idealist, but by people who don't read very well. Why, why would they, why, why are they thinking that Plato is an idealist? Because he keeps talking about ideals and forms. That's why. What about, what about um... Well, but, but I want to make sure she understands. No, no, I understand yeah, he, because yeah. he... And, and it's but you have to read carefully. It's, it's right there. I mean, yeah. I didn't make that up. You can see it. You, say you have the book at home. Go to page 153 and yeah, see Yeah, he says it's never actually going to, this, this ideal is never going to be a reality. Because, and the answer to someone's question, you know, if this can't be a reality, then why are you wasting our time? Who cares? And he says, because it serves as a standard to strive for. So where we're, yeah, where we're trying And to depending on the history of the place you're in, it will determine how far you could get towards this idea. So it's just a shallow understanding of... Well, that. I mean, it's not, it's not a shallow, it's just the people who don't read very well. It's not, it's, 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 it's worse than a shallow understanding. You know, when you read, you you read what you want to read, right? I mean, uh, just like the idealist reads, love thy neighbor as thyself, but in his mind, it's really just love thy neighbor. It's not a shallow understanding of that, it's just a complete misinterpretation. Okay. They don't have cataracts, they can see very well. But their theory of reality, which is at the heart of our being, 
causes it to interpret it this way. Just like you would take money and, and, and buy your kids uh, clothes or pay for education. And someone else with the same amount of money would buy new tires and rims for their car. And their kids would just have to be cold on a wintry night. So the balance is again important. Exactly. It's all about balance, yep. Now what about people who are martyrs? Well, that's who they are. And what was the name that Niebuhr gave to these people? Children of Light. Yeah. And he called them sentimentalists. Remember that term? Yeah. Sentimentalists. Exactly. But now a lot of people see Plato as a martyr. Or is it Socrates that drinks the... Uh, well, well, it's Socrates, not Plato. Right, right. But that's an interesting story. That's the reason I love these these dialects so much because there's all the questions. You can see the questions. So he's accused by the Athenian democracy, remember. It wasn't a, a dictatorship, it was a democracy. They've gotten rid of the Spartans, they've beaten the Spartans in the Peloponnesian Wars, and they established a democracy. It's a democracy that votes, the citizens of Athens vote to put Socrates to death. They said he was an enemy of the he was, he was an enemy of the state, and he was uh, destroying the uh, their children, corrupting the children. Now it happens to be true that he was a bisexual and, and was having sex with young boys, and that may have been part of what they meant by that, by the way. But it wasn't only what they meant. It was imparting dangerous ideas to these uh, to these children. The, you know, the, the love thy neighbor as thyself, it's like, uh, you know, so, you know, that, that, that's, that's, uh, that's in the, that's in the New Testament, you know, so, uh, but, so would you say, would you say Jesus is a realist or an idealist? Because, you know, he, he said, love thy neighbor as thyself, but he also died when he, you know, didn't have to die. Well, that's a little bit different, because that's his mission on earth, to die. His life has no meaning unless he dies. What does his death represent in Christianity? The fulfillment of, of the uh, prophecy. Of, uh, no, I understand yeah. that, but what does it do? In, in Christian theology... It takes on all our sins. It, 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 yeah, it's a sacrifice. Christianity has... You talk about telos. What's, un, what's unique about Christianity, which no other religion... Many religions are very, very similar in their belief. Like, for example, a flood story, and you know, that's just one example. But Christianity has something that no other religion even comes close, and that is original sin. That every beautiful newborn baby is born a sinner. So the question now becomes, how do you take that burden off your back? And so, and so that was Christ's mission on earth, to die not just die, but die a horribly painful death, which would absorb the, the, the original sin. It wouldn't make it possible for people to go to heaven just by that crucifixion, just by that sacrifice, but it would bring you to zero so that you weren't born with a debit. Do you, do you understand the point? Yeah. So he had to die. So that's a little bit different. So he really can't be described as a martyr because Christ didn't make that choice for himself. It was his purpose of living for the, from the very beginning. A martyr is someone who, okay, come on in and you can stay here for the rest of your life. And I don't care about the slave catchers and the consequences for my innocent wife and children. Yeah. That's a decision on their own. Okay, so that's a good question. So, so he's found guilty by the democracy that may be one of the reasons why Plato's not a big fan of democracy, because they're the ones who killed his mentor, who really didn't hurt anybody. He just talked to people and, and said things like, uh, who the hell wants to be in Turkey? You know, that kind of stuff. And, get, and, you know, and the next thing, he's dead. Um, but the Athenians don't want to create a martyr out of Socrates. 
So they tell him, on such and such day and such and such time, the jailer will kind of like go out for lunch and you can escape. Just make sure you get the hell out of the country because they don't want to create a martyr among them. They want him gone. They don't want him spreading these dangerous ideas. What is justice? And what is reality? And, you know. But he refuses to, 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 uh, to do that. Now the question becomes, is he a martyr? And he, he had a reason why. And, and, and there's this famous painting where all these begging him not to take the hemlock. In those days, that's how, that's how capital punishment was administered. You had to drink poison. And he explains to these people, he said, um, didn't I teach you that the abstraction is, is more real than the material representation? He said, yeah. He said, well, in that case, my physical body isn't as important as the, as the, as the ideals I'm trying to teach you. Not the, I didn't say that right, not the ideals, but the importance of ideals, the idea that ideals are important. Because most people only see material, the material world. So they say, yeah. He says, well, even though I, my body's going to die now, my ideals won't. My teaching won't. So I'm all right with that. They want me to escape because not only will I be, have disappeared from Athens, but then they could say he was a liar. He didn't really believe in ideals. He was more interested in the saving his own skin. So they backed him into a corner and he really didn't have a choice. Well, that's right. Well, is it true that his ideas have lived for 2,500, it's 399 when this happened, so that's like 2,500 years ago. Yeah. Is, it, is it true? How do you know that? Because it's been, you know, 2,500. Well, put it in, in the most basic way. How do we know that his ideas have not died? We still talk about when? Right now. Right now. Well, there you are. <laughs> and that was literally 2,500 2, years ago. 399. B.C. So he was right. So it's, that's not exact. So he didn't want to die. After all, this was a guy who every day, he didn't have a job. He married, he, he was smart enough to marry a very rich woman. And he lived off her money, off the money of her parents. She, 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 there it is. Kind of seems like a scoundrel, doesn't he? Huh? Messing with little boys, married a rich, rich well, woman, and, took care of, you know. Well, people, people I mean, I can't justify it, but that was, bisexuality was not unusual in, in no, ancient Greece. No, not, yeah, yeah. Not, I'm not saying it was. It just seems like he was a little bit of a, quite, quite a scoundrel, do you mean, scandalous do you, character. Do you bit. mean he used free will improperly sometimes? I think perhaps maybe he did. Well, but is that a human thing to do? Sounds like it. There you are. And so ultimately, in the end, no, though. but I mean, but I mean, that's but that's the point. In the end, it's kind of like uh, a scale. Yeah, so because in the end, I would say maybe he comes out on the plus side. Well, but that's all we can do. No human being is God. We'll all use our free will improperly, and so the it's, but it's not just one action. Even even in Catholicism, where a priest gives you the last rites. They give the last rites to these mafia murderers, people who have been directly responsible for the, for the most brutal murder of maybe hundreds, thousands of people in their lifetime. And so the last rites are, do you accept Christ into your life? And these guys would probably say yes. So the question now becomes that St. Peter has to make a, right? Yeah. a deliberation. Is that confession? so sincere that it outweighs the brutal murder, and, and, and that's not so easy to do. So it's not just the number of good things versus the number of bad things, it's also the intensity, and that's the, what it works. No human being can be all good and can be all bad. Only the devil is all bad, and only God is all good in, the, in this tradition. And human beings are somewhere in between. 
that comes with the territory. That comes with the territory. No questions. And the next knockoff from this is the materialists. Plato and Aristotle are very suspicious of, of, the, of, of uh, materialists. Um, well, I'm sorry, the next knockoff are the cynics who say, um, love thyself. The cynics That's, are, are materialists, well, the, too. The cynics are the materialists, because okay. your body is the most material thing about you. I mean, you know, right. yeah, I, wanted to make, I wanted to make sure I got the progression right. So the cynics are the materialists, because they, they care only about themselves. So, in our example, the um, escaping slaves coming across the wrong house present themselves to the cynical uh, father. And what does he do? Captures them and tries to sell them back. He sells them to the slave catchers. He gets a reward for selling them back. He, he, he makes pretend he's going to take care of them, contacts the slave catchers and gets a reward for returning them. Because for him, God's commandment to us through his eyes of materialism or cynicism is love thyself. You're acting re in a real human way when you love thyself. Materialist, cynic, that's what they are. They're selfish people. Uh, Donald Trump. What is Mueller going to find? As a, what exactly is he going to find? Money, as a money. Huh? Money, That's money. exactly right. You know that, don't you? Yeah. Bannon was talking about he, um, one of the main people on Mueller's team they brought over from the Enron investigation. He said, you know, but Bannon was talking about, you know, it's, it's clear that that's what they're after. And that's, that's what he built his team around was finding money laundering. So, so he's doing business with these uh, Russian <coughs> oligarchs. What does he want from the Russian oligarchs? Money. And loans. Yeah. Be because he's gone out of business how many dozens of times. I mean, he must owe people yeah. not millions, but billion, uh, literally billions of dollars. So he sure. wants money from these Russians. That's the collusion between him and the Russians. So now how do the Russians give him billions of dollars? Well, they can't, like, buy up his property. No, 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 no. They laundered the money, and we even know, at, even at this point, where they where what's the um, intermediary for the money? It's called the Deutsche Bank. You know how money laundering works, don't you? Yeah, you pass it through a bunch of places. So that it's impossible, or very, 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 very difficult, except for somebody like a hard-headed guy like Mueller to discover. This is what happened during the Watergate, you know. Dixon gave all this money to, the, to, to those guys who broke into the Democratic headquarters, but laundered it to dozens of places. So this Deutsche Bank apparently is the place where they laundered the money. So now Mueller has to find that source. So laundering money is a crime. Collusion with a foreign collusion, by the way, is not a legal term. But if you've made a deal with a, an enemy country, you understand that uh, you'll do business with them, and you also allow them to finagle the results of a democratic election. That's now all of a sudden collusion becomes uh, conflict of interest, which is a legal term. Did you know that collusion is not a legal term? It has horrible implications, but it's not. You can't go to jail for collusion unless it becomes conflict, a serious conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you're running for president for a free country, but a foreign country who happens to be your enemy makes it possible, that is about as much of a conflict of interest one could imagine. But it really is money laundering that they're looking for. You get um, into quid pro quo, is where you get into trouble. Exactly. That's exactly, that's exactly what, is, what, what it is. What does that mean? It something means you give something. something for something back. Okay.
You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. That's what it means in Latin. Okay. Now, every morning there's a, a, sh a talk show where this, this very intelligent young woman by the name of Rule. Have you seen it, R-U-H-L? And there's an Indian, well, it's, a, it's like at 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock. An Indian guy in Rule, so Veshi and Rule, something like that. And she's on top of all of this. And the reason is because before she became a TV personality, she was an executive at the Deutsche Bank. So even though she didn't have access to this particular dealing between her bank and Trump, she knows how they operate. So that's where we're getting all of this insight from her, even though she's not privy to exactly what's going on in the Mueller investigation. Now, I will say this, and I know Mueller is going to listen to this, that they better speed this up. I know he wants to do this properly, but if this keeps going on, the American people are going to lose interest and patience with this investigation. So they better find a compromise between a prudential, realistic compromise between getting this 110% right, but also revealing this to the American people. You know, the American people just have a kind of, how long do we have uh, patience for? It's like a minute and a half, right? Yeah. I, think, I, think we're good. I think they're going to find um, interesting stuff with um, um, the, the son-in-law. Um, because I, think I guess right. his father was a his father was a crook. Uh, tax tax finagler, yeah. Yeah, and I've read I've read how uh, how the Trump organization was you know were having political donors for the for the DA in New York. It had to you know basically save Jared Kushner. Uh, a couple of times. Where'd so. you read that? I'd like to know that. I, I'll, I'll, I'll try. <coughs> would it. you try to find it? Yeah, that would be interesting. I, I didn't know that. But yeah, I mean, I would imagine it, but I didn't know that specifically. But uh, yeah, his father was his father was prosecuted for stuff, but apparently he was like almost into some stuff too. His father was pro prosecuted by the U.S. attorney that from of New York of the, that part of New York that Trump fired immediately when he was elected. You remember that? That you, I don't remember, do you remember that episode? There was a U.S. attorney that was just terrific. U.S. attorney of the, um, of the lawyers for the government. You know, and they get right. information from the po federal police, the FBI. But they're the ones who do the prosecution. And they often do this through those, what are those laws that are supposed to be for the mafia? Racketeering. What are they called? RICO. The RICO laws. So he got his father. But this guy is, it was famous for really cracking down on uh, crooks, making the lives of innocent people miserable through their uh, underhanded dealings. So because of that background, he was the first U.S. attorney fired when Trump became president. Oftentimes, presidents will do that. It's kind of like... Uh, Somebody supports you for election, they make you, they fire you. But he was the first U.S. attorney fired when Trump was elected. So, um, you, see if, you, you if you're book? ever, uh, huh? Yeah. Have you read the book? Or you look the I've book? seen him on TV so much, it would be anticlimactic. <laughs> I mean, it, it goes on every TV show. You know the book, what is it called? The Fire and Fury. Yeah. I'm, Have you heard about it? Yeah, I've listened to I'm I'm on chapter three. Oh, so you. Yeah. Read that slow bishop. And they said, they, everyone asked the same question. No, how, would they, how would they allow you to have that kind of access? He said, first of all, I was sly enough to just kind of like be a fly in the wall. I didn't get in, I just sat on a couch in the Oval I never had, you know, I just listened and took yeah. tape recordings. The, uh... Nothing he says is surprising. I'm sure everything he says is. It's not surprising. He's not a particularly nice guy. Anyone who does that, by definition, is a sleazebag. But I'm glad he's giving us this information, even yeah. though we already know it. We know it's true. Well, they had a couple of pieces that I saw were interesting. I, I didn't read it, but I looked at the, you know, the highlight reading. I'll send you the audio book. I'm, I'm listening through the audio book. Yeah. I'll send you a link to it. 
they were talking about one of them. He uh, he turns around at one point. I think this is after he fired. Uh, uh, Comey. Yeah, yeah. And he turns around. and He says, "Where's my Roy Cohn?" So, "Where's my?" You were the guy who told me he was his mentor, and you couldn't find a more a bigger sleazebag. Roy Cohn was the lawyer for Joseph McCarthy. Right. One of the worst demagogues in all of American history. Well, and he turns around, well, like, so I think it was March or something, he turns around and he says, where's my Roy Cohn? Because nobody's, you know, you know who Roy Cohn is? Yeah, I remember. He's the one who showed me the New York Times article that, that made the link. The link between Trump's family. And between Trump himself, as a young man, he became, he allowed this guy, Roy, Roy Cohn was just. Kind of like a mentor. Or well, it, it, he was the lead attorney for Joseph McCarthy during the McCarthy, uh, Army McCarthy hearings that were televised when I was growing up. All of TV was canceled and you, and you watched this 24, it was remarkable because the American people finally saw what a horrible guy this McCarthy was. He was the one who said the entire society was run by communists. Eisenhower was a communist. General Marshall, the Secretary of State, who had just won the Nobel Prize for Peace, the Marshall Plan, was a paid agent of the Soviet Union. And American people, this was the era of uh, red baiting, believed him. So, they, so they, then he made the mistake of accusing the army from top to bottom of being run by uh, communist agents. And so the army sued him and those hearings came before Congress, and they were on TV. They were televised morning till night. So I'd see them when I got up to go to school, and I'd see, when I came home at 3.30, they were off. So they saw what a, because the Army insisted on seeing proof for his allegations, and of course, there was no proof. So the question was, why did he go after the Army in general, but also the commander of Fort Dix, which is a, which is a base where they would take, um, in those days, it was a draft. If you were drafted from New York, you went to Fort Dix, was in New Jersey, where they would train you to be in the Army. Why did he first go after this, so he divulged this in these hearings? It turns out that uh, uh, Cohn was a homosexual. That's not horrible, but there are good and bad homosexuals. And he had this young lover who was drafted. So Cohen, through McCarthy, put pressure on the commander of Fort Dix to make him like a general or a captain or a colonel within the first week of his training. And they said, no. <laughs> you know, they, I don't remember exactly what it was, but to be fav treated favorably. They said, no, we treat everyone the same. So that's what Cohen convinced McCarthy to go after this general, the commanding general of Fort Dix, and then expand that to the entire army. They wouldn't have it. In this case, the Army, U.S. Army were the heroes. In recent decades, they haven't been heroes that often, but in this case. And they demanded uh, that uh, he prove what he was saying. So that's, what, how do they, that's why he was particularly angry at the Army, because they wouldn't give this guy's young lover uh, favorable treatment. And that guy became the mentor for Donald Trump as he was growing up. So you can imagine the kind of, and I didn't know that, and he gave me some New York Times articles that, that demonstrated that. He, uh, they said whenever he got uh, um, HIV or AIDS, uh, the Donald Trump, you know, he, he dropped him. He, he was like, until then, you know, all the, you know, coin, uh, coin, Constantly, like, get in trouble for, for different legal whatever, and Donald Trump would always... Well, he taught Donald Trump that if anyone ever bothers you, just sue and sue and sue. Use all the money you have so that people you just make... Even if you lose, you, you've impoverished the people you're attacking. Right. And Cohen taught him that. He said that was, he taught him a lot of lessons, but that was the main lesson he taught him. Well, anyway, you got the picture. If you want to look for a contemporary example of a materialist slash syndic, Someone who cares only about himself, it's Donald Trump.